Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about double integrals over general regions. So earlier we talked about double integrals over rectangular regions, and now we're gonna extend that process to work for more complicated regions. So when we are computing these double integrals over these more general regions, it's pretty standard to describe the region as either a type one or a type two region. And so let's go ahead and now define what these type one and type two regions are, and we'll go ahead and start with type one. So a type one region is probably the region we're most familiar with, and that's where our region is gonna be bounded above and below by two functions of x. A type two region is gonna be bounded to the right and to the left by two functions of y. And so here's an example of what a type one region might look like. We have a curve that defines the top of our region that is a function of x, and that might be given by y equals g2 of x. And then we have another curve that defines the bottom of our region, and we're gonna go ahead and call that g2 of x. And so it's not always the case that our curves are going to intersect each other and close off our region. It might just be some empty space between our curves. And so then we'll just be looking at the region between these two curves over the interval of x values from a to b. So really the defining characteristic of a type one region is we are defining our region d by being bounded between a curve on top and a curve on bottom, what we're gonna call g2 and g1 of x. So some other examples of what a type one region might look like is well essentially maybe our two curves meet at one endpoint. So this top curve is still gonna be y equals g2 of x. And our bottom curve might also start at that same point. And maybe that looks like our new g1 of x. And so they do have a point of intersection here, which we could find by setting these two equations for g2 and g1 of x equal to each other and then solving for x but this other end of our region is not corresponding to a point of intersection between our two curves. So that just has to be given by some X value like X equals B or some known value. And so this is also an example of a type one region where that defining characteristic is we are bounding our region above and below by two functions of X. And the third picture of a type one region, which I don't have space to draw here is essentially similar to this, but our two curves meet at both endpoints of our region. And so we could have both kind of endpoints of the region correspond to points of intersections between our two curves. So we'll talk about how to set up a double integral when we are integrating over one of these type one regions later on. But the important thing to note for that process is just being able to identify which is the curve on top and which is the curve on bottom. So the other type of region that we're gonna be interested in are these type two regions. And so these regions are still living in our X and Y plane. But instead of these regions being bounded by curves on top and curves on bottom, they're gonna be bounded by curves on the right and curves on the left. So maybe our type two region might look something like this. And so here's an example of what a type two region might look like. And the idea is it's gonna be easiest to describe this region. Instead of using a curve on top and a curve on bottom, we use a rightmost curve and a leftmost curve. And so that means if we we're gonna write the equations for these curves, they're not gonna be written as y as a function of x. We're gonna instead have to write them as x as a function of y. So this rightmost curve, which is gonna be similar to that top curve in our type one regions, we might assign it an equation like x is equal to h2 of y. And the leftmost curve, which is giving us this left side of our region, might have a different equation that looks something like x equals h1 of y. So while it's totally possible these curves extend far beyond our region, so then we have to say for which y values between these curves is our region actually including. And so maybe that lower y value will be c and that highest y value will be d. And so remember the defining characteristic of a type two region is that we're bounding our region d here by one curve on the right and one curve on the left. And so there will be regions that exist out there that can be described as either a type one or a type two curve. And our order of integration or some other uh, piece of information might help us make that decision of which type of region to treat the problem with. And so just like with our type one regions, our type two regions do not necessarily have to look like this little sketch that I drew here. Let's go ahead and look at another example of a type two region. And it's gonna be kind of similar to the other example of a type one region we looked at. Well where the, uh, the end of our region might correspond to a point of intersection or it could not correspond to a point of intersection. So perhaps our leftmost curve for the second type of type two region looks something like this. And so this will be like our X equals H one of Y curve. And then our rightmost curve might share those top and bottom points, but it might look some, something different. It could look something like this. 
And so this curve would be given by another equation like x equals h2 of y. And now this region is closed off by these points of intersection. That's not too important or necessary. But the idea is this region might be easiest to describe with a right curve and then a left curve. And the region is just the space between those right and left curves on some interval of y values between c and d. So sometimes we'll be presented with a region we have to integrate over that can be described as a type 1 or a type 2 region, and we'll be able to solve that problem either way. What can sometimes also happen is we'll be given like a type 2 region, and it can be described by a single set of curves on the right or left, but we could actually express that as a type 1 region, but we'd have to break it up into multiple type 1 regions. But we'll talk more about that later on. Now that we've seen a couple pictures of these different types of regions, let's go ahead and write down the definitions for a type 1 and a type 2 region. All right, so we say a plane region D is a type 1 region if it lies between two continuous functions of x. And writing that in set notation, we can define a type 1 region D as the set of coordinates x and y such that our x values are between the constants of a and b and our y values are bounded between our two continuous functions of x, the lower function we're calling g1 of x, and the upper function we're calling g2 of x. And our definition for a type 2 region is going to look very, very similar. The roles of x and y are essentially just being swapped. And so we say a plane region D is going to be a type 2 region if that region is lying between two continuous functions of y. And in set notation, that would look like the set of points x, comma y, such that our y values are bounded between these constant numbers of c and d, and our x values will always lie between these two functions of y, h1 and h2. This lower function in this inequality, h1 of y, we always want to think of as the leftmost curve in our region, and the upper bounding function in this inequality, what we call h2 of y, is always going to be the rightmost curve, which we think of as the upper bound of our region. And so for a type 1 region, we think about the biggest y value and the smallest y value for determining the top and bottom curve. And for these type 2 regions, we just do the same thing but with x values. So the bigger x values are going to be to the right, and the smaller x values are going to be to the left. So instead of being top and bottom curves, we're right and left bounding curves instead. All right, so now that we have a sense of what these different type 1 and type 2 regions are, we're ready to talk about how do we evaluate a double integral over one of these more general regions. And so if we're looking at a type 1 region, then if our function f of x, y is continuous over our type 1 region that we're calling d, then the double integral of our function over the region d can be evaluated by the following iterated integral. So our outermost integral is the integral from a to b with respect to x, and our innermost integral, the one we evaluate first, is going to be the integral with respect to y, where our upper and lower limits of integration correspond to our lower and upper bounding curves for our region d. So when we're setting up one of these double integrals for a type 1 region, the outermost integral will be with respect to x, and those will be constant values, the constant x values to describe the left and right most endpoints or x values for our region. And then the inner integral is the one with respect to y. That lower limit of integration is always going to be our bottom curve for our region, which we will have to write as a function of x, so we'll have variables involved in this first integrals or the inner integrals limits of integration. And that upper limit of integration will also be a function of x, and so it will include x in its description, and that description is going to be that equation that describes the upper curve for our region. And so we look at some examples of evaluating one of these iterated integrals corresponding to a type 1 region. First we integrate with respect to y. After that, we'll be left with a single variable integral that only involves the variable of x, and the limits of integration will then have to be constants. So the type 2 region has a very similar conversation. So if z equals f of x, y is continuous over our region, right, we need to be continuous in order to integrate it, then if we want to express the double integral of our function f of x, y over our type 2 region, we can also do it using an iterated integral. The innermost integral is now going to be with respect to x. The lower limit of integration will be our leftmost curve that we call h1 of y and the upper limit of integration will be our rightmost curve that we call h2 of y. Then for the outer integral, we're going to be integrating with respect to y, and our y values will have to run through the corresponding bottom and top y values for our region d, which in general we call c and d. So 
So I don't want to spend too much time going into all the fine details of this integration process and what's happening geometrically. But really quickly, if we think about what's happening here for one of these iterated integrals, like for this type one region here, we're going to select and fix an X value, like maybe X equals A, and then that'll give us this region between these two Y values given by our functions of X, right? That region or interval of Y values will change for each X value we select. And then remember, we have a function of X and Y, which is giving us some Z value, like in or outside of the board. And then we essentially integrate that small slice to find like the area or very thin volume of that slice. Well, then we go to our next X value, repeat that process and add all the volumes or areas of these slices together to create the volume or the double integral of our function over the region D. And for a type two integral, we have the same process, but instead of looking at slices for a fixed X value, we're looking at slices for a fixed Y value. So we pick a Y value that gives us this little region here. So we integrate that for a fixed Y value over this interval of X values that that fixed Y value determines, find the area or volume of that slice, move on to the next Y value, repeat and add all those up. And that gives us our double integral. All right, so let's go ahead and look at an example of evaluating one of our double integrals over these more general regions. In this example, we're asked to evaluate the double integral over the region D of the function X plus two Y. And so our region D is defined as the region bounded between the two curves, Y equals two X squared and Y equals X squared plus one. And so looking at the information in the problem setup, we see that our curves are described as functions of X. So it's most likely that this is gonna be a type one region, but we always need to draw a picture of our region D when we are setting up one of these double integrals over a more general region. All right, so in order to visualize our region D and define the rest of our limits of integration, let's go ahead and graph our two curves, y equals two x squared and y equals x squared plus one. All right, so what does the graph of y equals two x squared look like? Well, it looks like a concave up parabola with a vertex at the origin that has been vertically stretched by a factor of two. So y equals two x squared will roughly look something like this. All right, so what about our other curve, y equals x squared plus one? That is also gonna be a concave up parabola. It won't be vertically stretched by a factor of two, but it will be shifted up one vertically, making its vertex at the point zero, one instead. And so now that we have both of our curves drawn on the plane, we can see that they are bounding a region and that region that is bounded between our two curves is our region D. Also in our picture, we can now verify which is the top curve for our region D and which is the bottom curve for our region D. That'll help us find the upper and lower limits of integration for that innermost integral, but we still have to find the limits of integration for that outermost integral, the one with respect to X. And those X values will correspond to the X values of the points of intersection between our two curves. Well, how do we find the points of intersection between our two curves? Well, we just set their equations equal to each other. X squared plus one is equal to two X squared, and then we solve. And to solve this equation, well, we can subtract X squared from each side, and we get one is equal to a single X squared. Then we can take the square root of each side, and remember to introduce a plus or minus sign when we do so. And we see that x is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of one or just plus or minus one. And so the x values for the region between our two curves that bind our region D are between negative one and positive one. Now that we have sketched our region D, we are ready to set up our iterated integral for this type one region. All right, so the function we are integrating is still x plus two y. And for a type one region, we are first going to integrate with respect to y and then with respect to x. So this innermost integral is gonna be the integral with respect to y. The lower limit of integration for this innermost integral is gonna be the lower curve for our region D, and that is given by the equation 2x squared. The upper limit of integration for our innermost integral is gonna be the curve that describes the top of our region D, and that'll be x squared plus one. Now we're ready to describe the limits of integration for the outermost integral, the one with respect to x, and that'll just be for these X values 
between negative one and positive one. All right, so now that we have our double iterated integral set up, we can go ahead and evaluate it. Remember, we evaluate the innermost integral first, so we have to integrate our function with respect to y, then evaluate that antiderivative at the upper and lower limit of integration while taking the difference between the output of our antiderivative at the upper and lower limit of integration. Okay, so what is the antiderivative of x with respect to y? Remember, when we were integrating with respect to y, all the other variables like x are treated as a constant. So that antiderivative will just be x times y. The antiderivative of 2y will be y squared. We still have to evaluate our antiderivative at the upper and lower limits of integration. We can take the difference between our antiderivative at those values, and then we'll be left with a single integral with respect to x. All right, I want to make sure I have enough space to write all this down, so let's go ahead and move down to the next line here. So we still have this outermost integral that we're going to worry about later with respect to x. Right now, we're evaluating our antiderivative at the upper and lower limits of integration. And remember, when we make these substitutions, these are our y values. So for the upper limit of integration, we're going to get x times x squared plus 1 plus y squared, which will now look like x squared plus 1 squared. So this is our antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit of integration. We have to subtract away from that our antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. And I recommend putting a big old set of parentheses around this uh, antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit to make sure we don't make any sign errors when distributing that negative sign or subtraction. All right, so now we're plugging y equals 2x squared into our general antiderivative. That'll give us x times 2x squared, which I'll just go ahead and simplify now as 2x cubed. And then we're going to get uh, y squared uh, added onto that. But that y squared is really going to be the quantity 2x squared. And if we square 2x squared, we're going to get 4x to the fourth. All right, and just because I'm running low on space here, I'm going to do a little scratch work and expanding this and simplifying everything. So if we distribute that factor of x here, we'll get x cubed plus x. If we square x squared plus 1, we'll get x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. And then we have to subtract away from this 2x cubed and 4x to the fourth. So now if we go ahead and combine these like terms, it looks like our biggest powers of x are to the fourth, and we'll have a total of negative 3x to the fourths. Then we look at our x cubes. We'll add those together to get a grand total of negative 1x cubed. Our x squared term is just 2x squared. Then our x term, our linear term, is just an x. And then we still have that constant of just 1. And so now to finish this off, we just have to evaluate the single variable integral with respect to x. And so what is the antiderivative of negative 3x to the fourth? It is negative 3x to the fifth over 5. All right, we're going to find all these antiderivatives now just using the power rule. The antiderivative of negative x cubed will be negative x to the fourth over 4. Then our next term, its antiderivative will look like 2x cubed over 3, followed by 1 half x squared, then plus an x. And we still have to evaluate this at the upper and lower limit of integration and take the difference between this antiderivative with respect to x at those values. And so we plug all that into our calculator, plug 1 in, find that number, plug negative 1 in, find that number, and then take the difference. All right, so now if we evaluate our antiderivative at that upper and lower limit of integration and split the difference, the final number that we end up with should be 32 over 15. And so we were not asked to interpret what this value of 32 over 15 uh, means geometrically for our double integral. But if we did want to try to interpret this, we can do so and think of it as a volume. If we think about the graph of the function z equals x plus 2y in three-dimensional space, that'll give us a tilted plane. And so what we're doing is we're finding the volume underneath this tilted plane over the region d that is bounded by our curves 2x squared and x squared plus 1. So 32 over 15 can be interpreted geometrically as the volume beneath this surface uh, over the region we are integrating over.